My message this morning is simply called, What Can the Righteous Do? What can the righteous do when we're living in a generation where difficulty seems to be abounding on all sides? And for those that have the eyes to see it, we appear to be witnessing the collapse of a nation. We appear to be living at a time when, just as Jesus foretold, when culture is rising against culture, confusion is starting to abound, wickedness is on the increase, the love of many is growing cold, wars and rumors of wars seem to be on the news constantly, acts of violence are becoming commonplace. What can we do? Now, I'm not going to start there, but I'm going to finish there in this message today. And we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 13, please, if you can. Jeremiah chapter 13. And what will you say when he punishes you? For you've taught them to be chieftains, to be head over you. Those that have survived the terror of the womb in our generation. He asked the question, he says, why are you terrified at their behavior? Didn't you teach them to be what they've become? Didn't you tell them there is no God? Didn't you mock and ridicule everything holy? Didn't you drive the Ten Commandments out of your colleges and out of your schools? So why are you terrified that they're behaving the way you taught them to behave? You sat them down in front of vile music. You sat them in front of vile videos. And that became their babysitters. You told them there was no God. And now they're losing heart. Now they're losing hope. You sat them in front of violent video games where they spend all day killing people, killing various things, and now you're perplexed because they're acting it out. It's so strange in our day, everybody asks all the questions except for the questions they should be asking. What have we taught our children to be and what have we taught them to do? We've taught them that there's no value to life. We've taught them that children are expendable in the womb. And even those that are born through botched abortions can be still killed. Though their hearts beat and though they cry, they can still be killed on the table of abortion. We taught them there's no value to life. So why are we suddenly perplexed when they're acting out what we've taught them to be? In verse 22, he says, you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? And I hear it in the news now. Why is this happening in our nation? Why are all these things coming upon us? Why is our society? And everybody asks the question, but nobody will ever go towards the answer. Because we have forsaken the living God. That's the reason. And you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? For the greatness of your iniquity, your skirts have been uncovered and your heels made bare. Before God brings the final judgment on a nation, he will show the nation. He always has throughout history. Study it yourself. Open your Bible. Study it. He will always show the nation why. Even did it with his own people. He will pull away the veil. He will expose the false righteousness. He will show the greed. It says in verse 22, I've exposed you to yourself so that everyone can see what you've become and why your judgment draws near. I'll show you what you are. I'll show you the greed in your society. I'll show you the immorality. I'll show you the love of lawlessness. I'll show you the broken families. I'll show you. I'll show you what you've become so that it's very clear. When your judgment comes, you'll know why it has come. For example, in this country, on September the 22nd, Senator John McCain expressed his sorrow over the Senate's failure to pass the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. He asked those who opposed the bill to consider what permitting late-term abortion says about our nation's commitment to, to fighting for life and standing up for human rights when our conscience calls us to. What kind of a nation have we become when our focus is saving some partridge in the desert or some smelt in a river, but we will sacrifice our children? What kind of a nation are we? What kind of a foolish people have we become 
as a society. And it's particularly disturbing in the light of some of the abortion practices that have recently become known and have been made public. You see, the Lord's pulling back the veil. He's showing us what we are as a people, what we are as a nation. There's no argument anymore. So that when our economy collapses, so that when our military is made weaker, when, when we seem to have no clear direction, we know why it's all coming upon us and why it's happening. When violence touches our schools, our streets, when our young people are roaming in gangs looking for a just society and they don't even know what it is. They have no idea what that looks like. It's just a word. It's just a phrase. They don't know what they're protesting about and what they're looking for. We've become a nation without a conscience. The Lord says, therefore, in verse 26, I'll uncover your skirts over your face that your shame may appear. In other words, I'm going to totally expose you to the world as the number one exporter of pornography, as people have lost their way, people who are powerless, the greed, all of these things that have come to the fore just in the last several years tells me that we're on the threshold of something that we had hoped would never come as a nation. It brings us to the question that David once asked in Psalm 11. Let me read it to you. He says, in the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. While the, the wicked are not shooting secretly anymore at the upright in heart, it's in the open. Then David asked the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can I do? What kind of a difference can I make? And that ought to be the cry of every heart. It doesn't matter how much influence and authority you have or whether you're a mover or shaker, whether you have a long history of successful spiritual walking with God, the question must be in your heart and in mine, what can I do? And the Lord keeps leading me back again to Acts chapter 27 where people on the ship just refused to hear the word of God. They were, they were bent on their own destruction and charting their own course, even though there was a man on board called Paul and he gave them a word and said, don't go this way. Don't do this thing. You're bringing the justice of God upon your own head in this foolish course. And then suddenly they found themselves in a storm, unable to navigate a, a clear course. They struck sail and committed themselves to the wind. And that seems to be where we are as a nation today. We've just struck sail and we're committing ourselves to the wind where we don't know where we're going to be carried and we don't know what we're going to do once we get there. They started throwing their tackling overboard. The things that had proven themselves for hundreds of years to, to be necessary for a successful journey, they started throwing them overboard. We threw overboard the traditional concept of marriage. We threw overboard the value of children. We've, we've thrown so much overboard in this country. It's just absolutely amazing. And when the all hope was taken away, there was a man in the belly of that ship who committed himself to pray. And that's where we start. We pray now. We pray. Prayer is not a program. Prayer is just not an add-on to the church. Prayer is not just an hour on Tuesday night. My brother, my sister, I'm telling you, from the bottom of my heart, whether you're a single mother bringing your kids here this Sunday, you're a businessman, you're unemployed, you're married, you're single, it doesn't matter. Every one of us have to pray. You must pray now. You must go to the throne of God. And you pray in whatever way you know how. Just talk to God. Don't make it a formula. Just talk to God. Just the way I'm talking to you. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to lower it. You don't have to speak biblical English. You just simply get into that closet and say, God, I'm scared. I don't know what tomorrow's bringing, but I know you're calling me to make a difference. For the purpose of your people in the earth is for renown, for praise, and for glory. So God, the nation might be throwing you overboard, but I'm not throwing you overboard. And I'm asking you to do through my life. I'm asking you to do through my life what only you can do. And if the nation rejects you, God, let me stand now as a light upon a hill. Let me be that source of hope and a guide for those that are fearful. 
in this hour and we'll be more fearful in the days just ahead of us. Give me a word from God. That's what Paul had. When he prayed in the belly of that ship, the Lord suddenly opened to him his future. It was not going to be an easy future for him. He was going to have to stand before Caesar, an absolute insane leader who thought he was God. And Paul was going to be brought there in chains. But knowing that God had given him a word and God gave him the people that were in the immediate vicinity of his journey, you and I need a word from God now. We need to know where we're going. If confusion is in the society around us, we're not called to be confused. Don't get your direction from the news. Get your direction from God. Get your direction 